Hello, my wonderful students. It is Ms. Rios, and here I am again uh, recording this video. This will be my official first, very first ever First Chapter Friday. And what a First Chapter Friday is, is that every Friday I'm going to be reading the first chapter of a novel that I am going to be recommending to you guys that I have read and that I and that I love. So I really hope that you enjoy this. And if you do like this first chapter and are interested in reading the book, please reach out to me through Remind or Google Classroom or my Google Voice number, and I will try my very best to get a copy for you in your hand so that you can read it. Okay, so let me go ahead and get started. So the first chapter that I'm going to be reading to you today is from the book, The False Prince. It is a wonderful book. It is by Jennifer Nielsen. Let me give you some background knowledge on it. This is the first book in a remarkable trilogy where an orphan is forced into a twisted game with deadly stakes. He has to choose to lie or choose to die. In a discontent kingdom, civil war is brewing. To unify divided people, Connor, a nobleman of the court, devises a cunning plan to find an impersonator of the king's long lost son and install him as a puppet prince. Four orphans are recruited to compete for the role, including a defiant boy named Sage, who is our protagonist. Sage knows that Connor's motives are more than questionable, yet his life balances on a sword's point. He must be chosen to play the prince or he will certainly be killed. But Sage's rivals have their own agendas as well. As Sage moves from a rundown orphanage to Connor's palace, he finds layer upon layer of treachery and deceit unfold, and finally a truth is revealed that in the end my, may very well prove more dangerous than all of the lies taken together. So this is the first chapter of The False Prince. If I had to do it all over again, I would not have chosen this life. Then again, I'm not sure I ever had a choice. These were my thoughts as I raced away from the market with a stolen rose tucked under my arm. I'd never attempted a roast thievery before, and I was already regretting it. It happens to be very difficult to hold a chunk of raw meat while running, more slippery than I had anticipated. If the butcher didn't catch me with his cleaver first and literally caught off my future plans, I vowed to remember to get the meat wrapped next time, then steal it. He was only a few paces behind now, chasing me at a better speed than I had expected for a man of his girth. He yelled very loudly in his native language, one I didn't recognize. He was originally from one of the far western countries, undoubtedly a country where, where killing a meat thief was allowed. It was a sort of thought that encouraged me to run faster. I rounded a corner just as the cleaver suddenly cut into a wood post behind me. Even though he was aiming for me, I couldn't help but admire his throwing accuracy. If I hadn't turned when I did, the cleaver would have found its target. But I was only a block from Mrs. Turbaldi's orphanage for disadvantaged boys. I knew how to disappear there. And I might have made it if not for the bald man sitting outside the tavern who stretched out his foot in time to trip me. Luckily, I had managed to keep hold of the roast, although it did no favors to my right shoulder as I fell onto the hard dirt road. The butcher leaned over and laughed. About time you get what's coming to you, you filthy beggar. As a point of fact, I hadn't begged for anything. It was beneath me. His laughter was quickly followed up with a kick to my back that chased my breath away. I curled into a ball, prepared for the beating I wasn't sure I'd live to regret. The butcher landed a second kick and he reared back for a third when another man shouted, stop! The butcher turned. You stay out of this. He stole a roast. An entire roast? Really? And what is the cost? Thirty garlands. 
My well-trained ears heard the sound of coins in a bag. Then the man said, I'll pay you 50 garlands if you turn that boy over to me now. 50? One moment. The butcher gave me a final kick on the side, then leaned low toward me. If you ever come into my shop again, I'll cut you up and sell you as meat at the market. Got it? The message was straightforward. I nodded. The man paid the butcher, who stomped away. I wanted to look up at whoever had saved me further from beating, but I was hunched in the only position that didn't send me gasping in pain, and I was in no hurry to change that. The pity I felt for myself wasn't shared with the man with the coins. He grabbed my shirt and yanked me to my feet. Our eyes locked as he lifted me. His were dark brown and more tightly focused than I'd ever seen before. He smiled slightly as he studied me, his thin mouth barely visible behind a neatly trimmed brown beard. He looked to be somewhere in his 40s and dressed in fine clothes of the upper class, but based on the way he lifted me, he was much stronger than I expected of a nobleman. I'll have a word with you, boy, he said. You'll walk with me to the orphanage or I'll have you carried there. Although I was eager to leave behind the tough streets of Kachar, servitude wasn't in my future plans, which meant I could walk as crookedly as I wanted. Besides, my right leg really hurt. Mrs. Turbledee's Orphanage for Disadvantaged Boys was the only place for orphan boys in the northern end of Kartha. Nineteen of us lived there, ranging in age from three to fifteen. I was almost fifteen, and any day now, Mrs. Turbledee would send me away. But I didn't want to leave yet, and certainly not as this stranger's servant boy. Mrs. Turbledee was waiting in her office when I walked in with a man close behind me. She was too fat to credibly claim she starved along with the rest of us, but strong enough to beat anyone who complained about that fact. In recent months, she and I had settled into a routine of barely tolerating each other. Mrs. Turbledee must have seen what happened outside because she shook her head and said, a roast? What were you thinking? That we had a lot of hungry boys, I said. You can't feed us bean bread every day and not have a revolt. You'll give me that roast then, she said, holding out her plump hands. Business first. I clutched the roast more tightly to myself and nodded at the man. Who's he? The man stepped forward. My name is Bevan Connor. Tell me yours. I stared at him without answering, which earned me a whack on the back of the head from Mrs. Turbledee's broom. His name is Sage, she told Connor. And as I told you before, you'd be better off with a rabbit badger than this one. Connor raised an eyebrow and stared at me as if that amused him, which was annoying because I had no interest in providing him with any entertainment. So I tossed my hair out of my eyes and said, she's right, so you can go now. Connor frowned and shook his head. The moment of amusement had passed. What can you do, boy? If you bothered to ask my name, you might use it. He continued as if he hadn't heard me. Also oh, annoying. What's your training? He don't have any, Mrs. Turbledee said. None a gentleman like yourself would need anyhow. What did your father do? Connor asked me. He was best as a musician, but still a terrible one, I said. If he made a single coin from playing, my family never sighed. He was probably a drunk, Mrs. Turbledee wrapped my ear with her knuckles. So this one's made his way through theft and lies. What sort of lies? I wasn't sure if the question was directed to me or Mrs. Turbledee, but he was looking at Mrs. Turbledee, so I let her speak. She took Connor by the arm and pulled him into the corner, which was an entirely useless gesture because not only was I standing right there and perfectly able to hear every word, but the story was also about me, so it was hardly a secret. Connor obliged, though I noticed he faced himself toward me as she spoke. First time the boy came here, he had a shiny silver coin in his hand, said he was a runaway the son of a dead duke from somewhere in Avenia, only he didn't want to be a duke. So if I took him in and gave him preferential care and a place to hide, he'd pay me a coin a week. 
kept it up for two weeks, all the time laughing it up on extra servings at dinner and with extra blankets on his bed. Connor glanced at me and I rolled my eyes. He'd be less impressed when she finished the story. Then one night he took with a fever, got all delirious late in night, hitting at everyone and yelling and such. I was there when he confessed it all. He's no son of anyone important. The coins belong to a duke, all right, but he'd stolen them to trick me into caring for him. I dumped his body into the cellar to get better or not. I didn't care. Next time I checked on him, he got over the fever on his own and was a good deal more humble. Connor looked at me again. He doesn't look so humble now. I got over that too, I said. So why'd you let him stay? Connor asked Mrs. Turbledy. Mrs. Turbledy hesitated. She didn't want to tell him it was because I picked up goodies for her now and then, ribbons for her hats or chocolates from the cake shop. Because of that, Mrs. Turbledy didn't hate me nearly as much as she pretended to. Or maybe she did. I stole from her too. Connor walked back to me. A thief and a liar, eh? Can you manage a sword? Sure, if my opponent doesn't have one. He grinned. Do you farm? No, I took that as an insult. Hunt? No. Can you read? I stared up at him through the parts of my hair. What are you wanting me for, Connor? You'll address me as Sir or Master Connor. What are you wanting for me, Sir Master Connor? That's a conversation for another time. Gather your things. I'll wait for you here. I shook my head. Sorry, but when I leave the comfort of Mrs. Turbledy's fine establishment, I go on my own. You're going with him, Mrs. Turbledy said. You've been bought and paid for by Master Connor, and I can't wait to get rid of you. You'll earn your freedom by doing whatever I ask of you and doing it well, Connor added. Or serve me poorly and serve me for life. I wouldn't serve anyone for an hour until freedom, I said. Connor took a step toward me, hands out. I threw the roast I'd been holding at him and he flinched to avoid it. Using that moment, I pushed past Mrs. Turbledy and darted into the street. It would have been helpful to know that he'd left a couple of vigils at the door. One grabbed my arms while the other clubbed me over the head from behind. I barely had time to curse their mother's graves before I crumpled to the ground. And that is the first chapter of The False Prince. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you liked it. And if you did and would like a copy of the book, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and I will get you a copy of the book. Thank you.